and this is important mission for gsli mastery program as after this success of this mission gsli mastery will be declared as operational and will join the group of operational vehicles pslv and gslb the payload for gsli mastery d2 is a very advanced high throughput satellite gsat 29 which is a multi band Hello. Yeah, I'm here. Yes, yes. Uh, shall we uh, start? Yeah, please, sir. Yes, please, okay. please. Okay. Then I'll uh, commence with the plenary session two, uh, and this is the session A. So we are about to start the plenary session two, uh, which is which has the topic middle atmosphere atmospheric coupling dynamics and climate change. uh we hand over the charge of the plenary session uh, to the chair this session is going to be chaired by uh, dr nirvika dashora and uh, the co-chair for this session is going to be dr tarun pant uh welcome to the session and now i hand over the charge to the session chairs i would also like to mention the uh, conveners and co-conveners so as convener for the session we have uh, dr kishor kumar k and uh, co conveners we have dr tarun pant dr d bala uh, subraman nayam uh, dr nirvika dashora so now we are going to commence uh, with the session but before that just a word of caution whenever you are presenting your uh, presentation you might get a request access control please do not click on it and if during the presentation you find that uh, someone is trying to take access of your uh, screen please ignore it or click on the deny button this is absolutely crucial for the session to run smoothly thank you now i hand over the charge to the session chairs and co-chair thank you may i request uh, tarun sir to begin with the session proceedings uh, uh thank you uh, uh, dr nirvikar uh it's a, it's our pleasure uh, to be uh, chairing the first uh, day's first session for this uh, national space science symposium 2022 uh it's a pleasure to be here um and we have uh, for today uh, very uh, good uh, talks lined up uh, concentrating on various aspects of uh, the middle atmosphere atmosphere coupling dynamics and climate change so i am sure uh we will be looking forward to uh, all these talks and uh, some some new aspects of uh, uh, these uh, research in these areas so with this uh, 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 words i invite uh, dr nirvikar to to chair the session uh um welcome sir uh with uh, with the uh, uh with the introduction to the session now now we are ready to have our uh, first talk and uh, it is uh, from professor ashik paul from university of calcutta uh, he would be presenting about the atmospheric sciences with the st radar facility uh, i request dr tarun kumar pan to uh, kindly introduce him for the purpose of the audience yeah sure uh so it's our uh, pleasure to introduce the uh, first speakers for today uh, uh, professor ashik paul uh he is a very good friend of uh, uh, ours uh, he is professor in institute of radio physics and electronics university of calcutta uh, he joined uh, uh, this institute in 2002 uh, his research uh, areas include uh, um, the aspects of uh, atmospheric conditions um during uh, you know different geophysical conditions uh, and conditions measuring uh, satellite uh, beacons through sa satellite beacons gnss optical and radar measurements uh, he has over the years uh, um, uh, guided uh, the doctoral works for eight uh, students and uh, more than 30 mtech uh, students have uh, completed their dissertations uh, uh, under him uh he has 120 more than 120 research publications uh, in various uh, journals um his uh, scientific collaborations 
expand uh, exist a uh, span between uh, international uh, and uh, national institutes national institutes like uh, space application uh, center uh, of isro iit delhi iit indore narl spl uh, gmrt and uh, on the international uh, uh, side uh, his uh, collaborations uh, extend to um, the the ucar which is uh, boulder usa uh he has also been uh, uh, involved in various international uh, programs um, which are uh, international space uh, conducted by international space science institute um and uh, he has over the years um, uh, uh, he has been involved in uh, programs like uh, plasma sphere ionosphere thermosphere integrated research environment and access uh, services which is um, uh, uh, which is a uh, a program uh, run by the european uh, union and he has been a part of the cinda uh, network uh, which which is a very uh, uh, you know very active uh, scintillation network uh, ground based uh, network uh, which uh, for uh, observing uh, scintillations uh, from the beacons on board uh, cosmic 2 uh, satellite he has been uh, he is the recipient of uh, rc young scientist award uh, for 2002 and the prestigious erasmus mundus uh, staff mobility scholarship uh, of european union and uh, he is a life member of uh, various uh, unions like american geophysical union uh, european Geo geosciences union uh, and uh, many other uh, like that so with these uh, uh, words uh, i it's my pleasure to invite uh, professor ashik paul to to deliver this lecture uh, professor ashik paul thank you dr pant and dr dasura uh, for this uh, kind words of introduction so <clears throat> let us get into the business of this uh, parallel session 2 and let us begin by sharing my screen So is the screen visible? Yes, it's visible and uh, you're audible. Thanks. Good afternoon, everybody. At the onset, I'd like to thank the organizers of this National Space Science Symposium, that is IDA Kolkata, and in particular SESI and Indian Space Research Organization for taking this initiative. I mean, the COVID pandemic, when it was not possible to have an in-person uh, meeting, it was. Uh, I understand uh, earlier scheduled for 2021, but now it's being held in 2022. And as in the morning inaugural session, uh, Chairman Isko had pointed out that this would be a kind of uh, continuing uh, <clears throat> program in the sense that when situations become uh, conducive. There will be outreach programs, in-person outreach programs organized as well. So uh, all these efforts will undoubtedly motivate and encourage the younger generation who are very much needed in uh, the area of space science nowadays. It is uh, always a pleasure to talk at the National Space Science Symposium because this was the forum or platform where. Uh, many of us uh, began our research journey 25 to 30 years back. Today, I will be talking about a new uh, facility which is coming up at University of Calcutta, a stratosphere to hosphere radar. It is still in the process of implementation, but a prototype already exists and on the basis of uh, this prototype the University of Calcutta project team had become familiarized with the, some of the features of both the lower atmosphere as well as ionosphere. The advent of these uh, <coughs> HP radars over the last few decades have uh, indeed been done with the objective that Pan India 
there will be a network of ground based measuring system which will be able to complement the space based or satellite based information that is available about the different layers of the atmosphere. So, uh, but most of these uh, facilities, major facilities, they uh, exist in uh, regions of the country, while the highly dynamic in terms of atmospheric activity, the eastern and the northeastern regions, that there are the void where this kind of ground-based instrumentation was not so much available. So in order to plug in that gap, University of Canada is implementing a 53 megahertz fully active base array radar at the Ionosphere 3 station of Kolkata, which is by itself a kind of a, a historical site as uh, uh, I will show maybe in a few moments. Now this uh, field station, as well as the radar site, is located about 50 kilometers northeast of Kolkata. And uh, some of the other uh, features which make this location a uh, uh, good one or an appropriate one is that, from the ionosphere point of view, it is uh, situated almost at the northern crest of the equatorial ionization anomaly. And talking about uh, the lower atmosphere or the terrestrial weather, this region also receives uh, very heavy rainfall and also very uh, severe nor'westers yeah, and tropical cyclones. So, uh, the thunderstorm and lightning activity, other than the heat convection, are also uh, some of the issues which make this. Uh, slightly different uh, from the atmospheric processes uh, which are uh, present in other sections of the Gangetic plate. So all these issues make Korinthar an important location to study the dynamics of the different uh, layers of the atmosphere and the coupling processes. Now this radar is uh, completely indigenously developed and uh, the funding has been uh, obtained from the Science and Engineering Research Board of the Government of India under its key intensification of research in high priority areas. So this has been planned as a national facility which will be available, accessible to all academicians and researchers from across the country as well as beyond. The Institute of Radio Physics and Electronics uh, has been extremely fortunate to have a league of extraordinary scientists, notable among them being Professor Shishi Kumar Mitro, who founded our department and was one of the first in the world to suggest the use of these uh, radars for atmospheric studies way back in the 1930s. Also, the first experimental evidence of uh, the E layer, which was predicted by uh, Heaviside and Kennedy, the experimental evidence of that was provided by uh, Mitro and his group. And his book, The Upper Atmosphere, that is still considered quite relevant among the student community. And in this uh, picture, right next to him is his very last year student, Dr. A.P. Mitra, who was also associated, closely associated with our department and later on going to become the Director General of CSI. Incidentally, uh, our department was one of the first in India to start postgraduate teaching in electronics around 1949. But prior to that, ionosphere studies from uh, this department in the 1930s, uh, it made very important contribution in advancement of the uh, subject. And there are a host of papers being published by Metro and his uh, group in the 1930s, as well as later on. 
The field station was established in 1953 at Torinara. And uh, it was around that time that Professor Mitro also assembled one of the first manual atmospheric sounding systems in Asia. And uh, it started its operation. And uh, the data from that MVS C2 ions on that uh, was available up to 1976 uh, at the SPIDER, that is the Space Physics Data Interactive uh, Resources website of NGDC. But thereafter, uh, with the unavailability of spares and also the aging of instruments and other uh, infrastructural issues, the operation of these items on stopped and most of the subsequent uh, activities related to space science was done using satellite based receivers or satellite based systems. Now, the background with this background, it is not surprising that. Uh, our department has got a very strong interest as well as uh, good research groups which are working to understand the various ionospheric features present in the equatorial as well as the low latitudes. And at the same time, we have to keep this in mind that uh, this transitional region from the uh, crest of the anomaly to the mid latitudes is an area which is still are uh, not very uh, extensively examined in the Indian longitude sector, at least in the Indian longitude sector. And so, our research activities in this domain, it ranges from the high frequency to l band and also with the recently, uh, recent availability of the Indian regional navigation satellite system, it uh, has extended even up to the s band so, uh, the emphasis behind uh, even these frequencies they stem from the fact that these frequency bands they host a significant proportion of the satellite based communication and navigation links. And so, from the application point of view or from the user's point of view, when these signals are degraded either partially or sometimes there is a complete outage, then that significantly affects a uh, vast cross-section of the modern society where knowingly or unknowingly we are using different kinds of radio uh, satellite signals uh, for a day-to-day -day life. Our department uh, operates a number of active and passive uh, systems now around this northern crest of the anomaly and as well as at some other remote locations. So presently, uh, if we go uh, in a sequence of increasing frequency, we have this uh, radar which is coming up at 53 megahertz. Then, uh, <clears throat> by virtue of our collaboration with the Space Physics Laboratory, uh, we have one traffic receiver which is capable of tracking satellite beacon from low earth orbiting satellites at 150 and 400 megahertz. We have the geostationary satellite tracking system at 250 megahertz, GPS, and as I even mentioned, the Indian regional navigation satellite system around 2.5 gigahertz. The basic objective, as I have mentioned, behind all of these exercises is to have and uh, some advancement in our present understanding of the signal in space performance. And we have to keep this in mind that uh, in the global perspective, space weather, which is uh, sometimes associated with, it is sometimes associated with the geomagnetic disturbed conditions can be, can have, significant impact in the equatorial and low latitudes even under geomagnetic benign conditions. So that is of uh, more serious nature in our latitude sector. While in the mid latitudes and in the polar regions, they are usually associated, space weather events are usually associated with the geomagnetic disturbed condition. 
So one of the fallouts of these uh, uh, ionospheric adversities is that sometimes it may result in deep power fade outs, resulting in loss of loss of the signal, which could have uh, sometimes even life threatening consequences for high dynamic platforms like uh, airplanes. And this kind of a uh, uh, feature and this consciousness is gradually increasing not only among the researchers and scientists but also among the policy makers uh, even in our country and uh, one of the important uh, aspects which we are also looking at is that nowadays a uh, significant proportion of the aircrafts are being uh, gradually being designed which will be flying at higher altitudes and which will definitely increase the human risk to radiation during this kind of severe space weather events. Of course, uh, the major source of radiation we know that during this air travel that comes from the flight itself and when we have these solar storms, it would increase the risk many fold. So, the location of our station is uh, somewhere around here, almost near the northern crest of the anomaly. And as a result, when we operate, uh, say for example, the radar, then the basic idea has to be that the signal has to satisfy the condition of orthogonality with the geomagnetic field lines to be scattered and to be backscattered. So, uh, that condition is satisfied sometimes around 29 degrees to 30 degrees north, uh, looked at as looking north from Kolkata. So, that means the beam, the radar beam, has to be directed towards that location. So, that was uh, one of the uh, objectives which was also one of the primary factors which helped in deciding the frequency of this radar to be around 50 megahertz and not like 200 or 400 megahertz. This project, uh, this ST radar project was initiated and uh, it purely goes to the credit of uh, late uh, Professor Ashish Kumar Dasgupta, a renowned scientist and also uh, a renowned faculty and my supervisor at the University of Calcutta. Now this radar which is coming up is uh, unique in several aspects. First of all, this location is like a kind of a transition from the tropics to the subtropics and near the northern crest of the equatorial ionization animal. So globally, if I'm not wrong, most of the radars are concentrated around the magnetic equator or in the mid to high latitudes and polar regions. So, at least in the Indian eastern and northeastern regions, uh, there are no other radars around this frequency uh, which are present. And also, most likely in the Southeast Asian longitude sector. The challenge will be that although this will be the first 50 megahertz active phase cell radar in an Indian university and only the third such radar in India, the challenge will be that in an university system, there will be severe issues of resources at a later date, which we can envisage right now. But there will be additional uh, positives also in the sense that students could be groomed and there will be a good availability of students who could be trained in operation, analysis and scientific interpretation of the radar data. So, coming to the specification of this uh, radar, this will be uh, at 53 megahertz and the bandwidth will be about 3 megahertz and this shows a kind of near circular, 100 meter diameter near circular uh, area over which the radars will be, the antennas will be arranged in uh, some kind of a hexagonal shape 
with 90 uh, in each of these hexagons and the remaining uh, antennas they will be distributed around the periphery and this uh, there will be like 475 number of three element DRV antennas each uh, being able to transmit a peak power of about 2 kilowatt. So the total power to be transmitted we are looking at something like 950 kilowatts but we will be operating mostly around uh, 3.2 to 5 percent duty ratio and this uh, radar beam could be steered up to an offset angle of uh, 30 degree officially but actually we have seen that we could tilt it even up to 40 degree and uh, when completed and fully commissioned it is expected to provide high coverage up to 20 kilometer uh, and with a height resolution of about 50 meter up to the first 3 kilometer and about 150 meter thereafter. So, uh, this radar will also uh, have a digital receiver which will have 25 channels. So, that will be a first time in India, but along with this, uh, uh, what I should say, benefit comes the huge challenge for data throughput and storage, which we are still kind of working out. Uh, of course, uh, National Atmospheric Research Laboratory in ARL has uh, helped us in a big way. Uh, both in the design, uh, in deciding the design parameters as well as some of the initial exercises to be performed by our team. So, uh, this receiver, this will have a dynamic uh, range of around 80 dB and a bandwidth of about 8 megahertz, although like 6 megahertz will also uh, do fine. So, when we started this uh, actual field implementation, one of the first things that we did was to develop a kind of a prototype, <clears throat> which will be a kind of a proof of concept and will also enable uh, our radar team to become the leader. So, one grid of 19 uh, transmitters and receivers and antenna was uh, constructed at Polinata and they were all aligned along the geomagnetic north-south direction and uh, so this started functioning somewhere around the middle of 2018. So it has been like uh, three and a half years that this process has is going on and uh, this is more or less uh, the location according to Google of this uh, pilot at its site and then this shows the progressive or stage-wise uh, view of the main area, which is spread over nearly 7,000 square meter. So uh, this is the stage-wise, like uh, when the when all these uh, antenna pedestals were set up, and then uh, the personnel from Indian Institute of Geomagnetism they also helped us a lot in. Uh, checking for the geomagnetic north direction so that the alignment is uh, good and as of now uh, this is a very recent image from the radar site where nearly 85 percent of the antennas they have been uh, already installed and the active transmitter and receiver components are now being set up and Hopefully, I mean, uh, we have to hope only because uh, from March 2020 till date, there has been a different periods of time when work has to be uh, stopped because of this COVID pandemic. But still, we are hopeful that within the next few months, this radar could be handed over to Catholic University for performing the various acceptance tests and only after a uh, successful uh, acceptance of the various radar parameters can be declared that this radar is now commissioned. So, the radar control software that is also uh, being developed, it is not uh, yet fully uh, 
uh, finished, we cannot say that. And the multi channel digital receiver, that is also like uh, different issues uh, we are trying to address with the help of the various national level experts. So, our uh, background being very strongly on the ionosphere aspect, some of the first things that we did uh, when we got access to this pilot version or the prototype version of the data was to look for the ionosphere space and uh, starting from around uh, 2019 March, we had at different points of time got signatures of the ionospheric e region irregularities. So, as we could see over here, that this is from 25th March, and we are having these uh, backscattered signatures from heights of around, say, 150 to 160 kilometers. And one of the important things to note is the descending pattern of the, or the descending slope of these irregularities. So these are mostly like uh, nighttime phenomena, as is expected during the equinoctial months from our region. But uh, there were some early morning, early evening uh, features as well from uh, lower altitudes. And uh, this one also from June. This is in 2019 June, the summer months. And this is also another date in June. Then, uh, with the kind advice from uh, Director NAL, we also performed some campaign mode observations jointly in collaboration with NRL. And there, what we did was that during July and August 2019, we operated the radar for different periods of time. Sometimes it was operated for a full 24 hours, like in second to third hours, as you can see that from 6 in the morning to 6 next morning. And what was surprising uh, for us is that. Uh, because e-region irregularity study was not uh, has not been done extensively from the anomaly based region in our uh, longitude sector. So we were surprised to note that we were having this kind of uh, irregularities occurring from uh, around say 100 kilometers we were getting the backscatters uh, early in the morning like say 8 to 9 in the morning then in the afternoon as well as uh, next morning, early morning period. And uh, as I had mentioned earlier, that there is some kind of a, a slope, a descending slope, which has been observed. So, uh, what is important to know from all these is that uh, the location of uh, the geomagnetic uh, location of Polimhaka being around uh, magnetic tip of 36.2 degrees north. So the Doppler spectra that we are getting from this location, they are quite different from that in the equatorial region, like at NARL, say for example. But they resemble off-equatorial low latitude and mid-latitude features. So some of these uh, results have been published in this paper last year, jointly with uh, NARL. Then we also wanted to take a look at the day-to-day -day variability in the occurrence of this E region. So what we did was that we operated the radar like during the daytime from 6 in the morning to 6 in the evening for these periods of time and then again from 6 in the evening to 6 next morning on some other period, both in July 2019. And what we could see from here is that there are differences both in the time of occurrence, the local time, as well as the heights from which we are getting these signatures. And this kind of field uh, aligned irregularity echoes uh, that we have observed from Borinkata, they are usually you know, kind of patchy in nature and they uh, consistently show a kind of descending pattern. There have been efforts also to identify some quasi periodic nature in these echoes. Then uh, we also performed a kind of uh, coordinated observation 
with NaRL, the 30 megahertz radar at NaRL, and compared the observations uh, with our results. So what we uh, see is that the uh, considerable differences uh, we can know in the FAI echoes that we had observed from uh, NaRL and that we had seen from our location. So, uh, as we can see that on 4th of July, that is on this day, there were strong echoes in the form of a descending uh, layer at Galangi, but from our location, it was weak or almost absent. While on 5th and 6th of July, that is uh, on these days, 5th July and 6th July, we could see that there were patchy natures of uh, echoing regions from both locations. But there was no correlation in terms of, you know, the height as well as the time of occurrence. Now, as I had mentioned earlier, that these results are unique because uh, there are no other uh, around 50 megahertz active peristeric measurements being done from the eastern and northeastern parts of India around the crest of the anomaly. And there are efforts now. Uh, initiated by NARL to form a kind of a national radar consortium where uh, other than NARL, Kochi University of Science and Technology, they have a radar around 205 megahertz, Calcutta University, Gohati University and Alice Nainital will also be kind of partners in this kind of a consortium. And there are efforts to form joint uh, campaign mode observations. Now, uh, for the purpose of validation of these uh, pilot uh, radar observations, we also approach Space Physics Laboratory, Vikram Saravai Space Center, and they kindly agreed to launch uh, radio sondes from our location. That was also in July and August uh, 2019. Dr. Sunil Kumar and his team they kindly agreed to launch about uh, 100 balloons from our location during this uh, campaign mode. That means uh, the balloons were launched and uh, our radar was also operated. So, the validation of these uh, measurements, wind measurements, that is also now uh, in the process of uh, revision in journals. Now, one of the uh, basic features that we could observe was that after we had classified the uh, wind measurements into, you know, kind of uh, beamed them, plugged them into precipitation and non-precipitation cases, we find that, for example, on 14th of July, the zonal wind, this was uh, westerly, while the meridional wind, in this case, this was normally with a maximum value of around uh, 10 meters per second, while on 7th August, there was a kind of a reversal in the zonal wind and as well as in the uh, meridional wind. But what we found was that uh, there were good correspondence between the radar and the radio sonde observations with minor differences in the upper left, in the upper altitudes, uh, like about 6 kilometers. But around, say for example, uh, 2 to 4 kilometers, that range, there was uh, some kind of a good correspondence which was observed. And then for the uh, non-precipitation cases also, what we found was that there was kind of a moderate correspondence between the radar and radio sonar measurements. So one of the factors uh, behind this, some of the outliers, data outliers, could be the fact that uh, there are different spatial and temporal resolutions of these uh, measuring instruments and also the wind width of the pilot array that is quite big. Okay, so once the main array becomes functional, then there are uh, plans to once again have uh, kind of coordinated observations with radio something launches from the radar site. So, uh, these are also uh, measurements which were done and the difference and the percentage of difference that was also uh, calculated from that. 
So, what we can see from these uh, pictures is that the percentage difference is like for the non precipitation cases, it is uh, within plus minus 20 percent, while for the precipitation cases in the range of altitude in the one to two kilometer, it is a little more than 20 percent. That means during the precipitation cases, what we have found, what we have understood is that the deviations are more. Then, when we look at this uh, overall, you know, correlation of the radar and radio sound emission, zona, the and waves. So we were having uh, correlation coefficients of like 0.94 and 0.79 for the zonal and meridional waves respectively, while the linear regression slopes were close to unit in uh, for these uh, two different cases. And here also the scattering of the points away from the regression line that could be due to the different measurement techniques as well as you know the large beam width of this uh, single sub array. So uh, moving ahead, once uh, we classify the data that we had done on the basis of the precipitation and the non-precipitation cases, so there also we find that the data points for the non-precipitation cases, they lie closer to the regression line compared to the precipitation cases. That means the data outliers are more in case of the precipitation events. Then, uh, during the last, say, two to three years, there have been a number of uh, severe uh, cyclones which have affected our location or around the location. And uh, one of our objectives was that, given the opportunity, we would like to also, you know, kind of operate the radar during this kind of a severe weather condition. So, during cyclone Amphan, uh, we could operate our radar for a certain amount of time, not for the entire duration, of course, on 20th May 2020. Uh, we could not operate because uh, there were severe electrical uh, shortages, uh, power outages that happened there. So, uh, what we did was that the observations that we could make during that period of time, we also took help from the Doppler weather radar, which is uh, operated by IMD at Kolkata. And we kind of clapped the computer. Professor, I think Paul, may I interrupt you? Yeah, please. Yeah, you have uh, five more minutes, sir. Sure, thank you. Yeah, sorry for a minute. Yeah. Yeah. Please continue. So, uh, what we did by combining these uh, different uh, data was that we observed the vertical profile of the relative humidity and found it that they started to increase uh, around 19th May and further intensified on 20th May. And then also, the vertical uh, profile of the wind speed that started to increase over the side from May 20 onwards, and uh, it became quite severe after that. Then there were also some, uh, some uh, analysis done on the profile of the microphysical parameters over this region, like the liquid water content. And in order to study the spatial variability of the clouds also, uh, we use this uh, VWR data and uh, these things are also now under revision uh, in the journal and I will uh, skip these things now for the time being because of shortage of time. So other than what has been done with the pilot uh, radar so far, there are immense opportunities of using the main array uh, when it becomes available hopefully in uh, the next few months, that there could be, you know, kind of uh, study, uh, study of the dynamics of this uh, stratosphere troposphere exchange, the convection processes in the troposphere, then to understand the rate structures based on the signatures of precipitating layers, then the lower atmospheric turbulence, gravity waves, and coming to the ionosphere E and F layers, now that, you know, uh, last October, as well as a few days back, we had some ionospheric effects being observed from Kolkata. 
So maybe this equinox or in the next year, uh, there could be, we could expect some more atmospheric activity. And then the meteor ionization as well. In addition, I would like to mention that because there is a huge component of you know digital signal processing, then uh, the antenna design as well as the multi-channel digital receivers. So the student community from these different branches, like from computer science, like for example from computer science and IT, from electronics and communication engineering and other disciplines, they could also get involved in the activities of this radar when it becomes operational. That could be in the form of internship, that could be in the form of small student projects. The basic idea is to involve the younger generation and the student community with this kind of a national facility. And uh, already we had uh, about two years back one uh, outreach program wherein different universities and departments they participated in uh, with their plans of how they want to utilize this and as you can see from this list that a number of universities from the northeast as well as Kodal uh, from IIT, Kharagpur, BHU, uh, Isaac Kolkata is a very important collaborator being situated uh, very close to us and then Bose Institute, IITM, Pune, NAI of course they are doing a great job in handholding this facility and SPL is performing the same thing as well. So all these different uh, organizations have already come forward with some plans of how they want to utilize this facility. So the uh, student community, particularly the younger generation, they are strongly encouraged to approach us with their plans of how they want to utilize this or to simply visit this site once it becomes available. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Ashik Paul. Uh, the session is now open for some questions, uh, some quick one. I have not received any question in chat. Hello. Professor Paul, are you able to hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Okay, so uh, I have no questions coming at this moment. Uh, in that case, uh, I would uh, have one query I just asked for the purpose of my clarification. Sure. Uh, that uh, the ST radar, which is uh, right now uh, at uh, kind of operational phase, am I correct? It is in operational phase right now? No, not fully operational as yet, like 7 to 10 grids that will be made operational uh, by the first, by the 15th of February. And thereafter, uh, around the end of March, we plan to make it fully operational. But of course, uh, as you may be aware that there has to be, you know, this uh, ATPs, the acceptance test procedures followed before it could be formally commissioned. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so thank you for this clarification. One uh, question is coming from Manohar Lal. Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, please, uh, uh, Dr. Manohar Lal, please put up. I want to ask one question. Sure. Hello. I'm not able to listen any question right now. Uh, okay, Nirika, this is Vikishore from SPL. Okay. Yeah, I am having one uh, uh, clarification from yeah, uh, Professor right. Ashik. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, Professor Ashik Paul, uh, in the final version of the radar, how many uh, digital receiver channels we can record simultaneously? How many channels? See, there will be like, it will be a 25 channel digital receiver okay. uh, as far the technical specifications which have been, you know, kind of uh, finalized by the technical committee which is looking uh, at the technical aspect of this radar. So, okay. 
that is theoretically the plan but i must also add over here that this is going to be a big challenge uh, yeah yeah exactly those who are familiar with the operation of redux you are already aware that uh, 25 channel uh, could be a very big issue as far as data throughput and data storage is concerned i think yeah, yeah. sora is also uh, aware of this uh, only on special occasions we can use that, but uh, having number of channels is good uh, for uh, long yes. run. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. If any, one more question we'll take. If any, uh, I'm not seeing any question. Uh, so let me thank uh, Professor Ashit Paul to you and uh, many many congratulations. It was a very scintillating talk, and uh, we can see the effort that has been put in last uh, decade or so intense effort to bring this radar and definitely the community and uh, as a whole ionosphere and space weather community is going to benefit even the lower atmospheric uh, effects you have shown so thank you very much for this and very informative and uh, very good talk uh, with this i think uh, uh, we can move to next talk professor paul yes yeah thank you very much sir uh, if you have any last comment no thanks that's all okay. uh, my only concern is that uh, there should be you know sufficient number of uh, young students who should be involved with this kind of a uh, business that is very important yeah 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 definitely that message you have given through your uh, presentation and uh, explicitly as well thank you sir thank you very much well, sir. okay so then we we go for the uh, next uh, presentation and uh, uh, dr tarun kumar pan yes Sir, i'll ready? just uh, share my uh, screen yeah so just i will say a word for the title of the talk is uh, study of daytime irrigation ionospheric uh, observ uh, observations of the journal drift and high to low latitude coupling this uh, talk also is uh, having a very interesting radar observation right below from the deep equator. So I welcome Dr. Tarun Kumar Pan for the talk. Please, sir. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nirvikar. I, I hope my uh, slide is uh, visible now. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, so you as you uh, rightly or? said, uh, we are continuing with the radar uh, observations. And um, uh, so what I'll be presenting uh, today uh, would be the uh, ionospheric observation, especially concerning the uh, E region, that is the dynamo region over the equatorial uh, uh, ionosphere, over the over equator. And then uh, towards the uh, end of the uh, presentation, uh, I'll try to highlight uh, mm, uh, some sort of a, a high to low latitude coupling uh, or the signatures of a coupling that we are uh, seeing in these uh, uh, observations. So uh, for, uh, uh, for those uh, who are not very familiar with the uh, uh, radar, uh, which is uh, working at the uh, site of uh, Trivandrum, um, we have actually uh, uh, HF radar uh, working at uh, 18 megahertz, um, and uh, which uh, 18 megahertz essentially corresponds to uh, a scale size of uh, 8.3 meter, which is uh, daytime, if you're observing in the dynamo uh, um, uh, region of the ionosphere, you are essentially looking at the type 2 uh, ecos and the drift of type 2 ecos. So basically what we see uh, in these uh, slant beams of uh, uh, radar in the eastward and westward uh, beams, uh, through the use of these beams, we can uh, uh, observe the drift, the ionospheric uh, drift. Um, by looking at this 8.3 meter uh, scale uh, uh, irregularities and their uh, drift in the electrojet. And uh, um, so as, as long as the observation of the uh, drift is concerned, it is not very uh, new. Uh, as you all uh, are aware that these drifts uh, are measured and they, ha they had been uh, measured earlier uh, from equatorial latitudes across the globe. But what is important is using these uh, drifts, we can actually uh, indirectly estimate the uh, electric field. That is the uh, the uh, large scale electric field which is uh, present there. And uh, uh, to derive that from the ionospheric drift, we uh, approach, we adopt uh, uh, an approach which, ha which has been given earlier by uh, Reddy et al. Um, and uh, which is essentially based on the, the drifts. 
from the drifts we uh, th through the ionospheric observations of ionosond uh, we can get the real estimate of electron density and using these electron density in conjunction with the uh, ionos with the uh, neutral atmospheric model like amsis we can have a, a model simulation and try to fit a drift profile uh, which which is uh, which is accurate or which is like overlying with the observations of the uh, ionospheric drift with altitude and through that we can actually get an estimate of the uh, electric field so that is essentially the uh, the approach that we have uh, estimated so what you are seeing is that the black curve which is the altitude profile uh, and the red ones are the observations and as you know the the observations are actually slightly shifted with respect to the uh, the expected one uh, so what we do is in order to fit it exactly uh, the way uh, as we expect we need to do certain changes in the uh, in the uh, uh, in the profile and that comes through the electric field estimation and that is the variation of the electric field and that is how we get the uh, electric field estimate <laughs> Uh, and uh, to to ensure that whatever we are doing is uh, making sense and uh, we are uh, we are doing it realistically what we can actually do is uh, once we have the uh, estimate on the electric field and the uh, the, the current density uh, we can actually uh, estimate the the magnetic field induced by the current on the ground as uh, observed by the magnetometer so it means we can estimate the magnetic field and compare it with actually measured magnetic field on the ground and if they are close it means our estimation is uh, uh, is is uh, uh, nearby is uh, corroborating so that's exactly what is happening we we are comparing here uh, the magnetic field observed on four different uh, conditions of uh, uh, equatorial electrojet and we are seeing that the estimated electric field uh, and the observed electric uh, observed magnetic field are pretty close uh, so that uh, sort of uh, gives us a confidence that whatever we are doing is uh, correct so now i'll show you the uh, the uh, uh, the ionospheric drifts measured by the uh, 18 megahertz radar uh, so these are the uh, observations we did during july august uh, uh, last year and uh, what we found was something very interesting what you can uh, see here is that we observed kind of four different trends of uh, daytime uh, ionospheric drifts the first kind was the drift where we had a pre noon uh, maxima that you are seeing here at 11 o'clock where my cursor is the other type is where we saw the maxima uh, happening around noon time uh, that is uh, the second one the third type was where we saw the uh, the the maxima in the drift appearing in the post uh, noon that's around somewhere around 3 o'clock that is uh, uh, here and the fourth one was uh, where we saw kind of a reverse uh, trend with a minimum around noon and a maxima or either in the morning uh, um, in the morning as well as in the uh, post noon uh, time so these are the four different kinds of trends we we observed in the ionospheric uh, drifts and just to show you uh, uh, how these drifts were on a day to day basis uh, the, uh, i'm i'm showing you on uh, different uh, uh, days so you can very clearly see the variability of these ionospheric drift at different heights and the kind of variabilities which are involved in that the uh, the small scale uh, variability or the small scale oscillations that you are seeing in the drift are actually indicators of uh, the the uh, wave like uh, uh, oscillations in the medium which probably are due to the gravity wave uh, activity which are uh, uh, which have their origin in the lower atmosphere uh, but the overall trends are very different very uh, day to day and uh, this is where we saw the noon time uh, maxima you are uh, you are here again you are seeing the short scale uh, oscillations at different heights with slight phase differences but then the trends are that you have a noon time uh, maxima then we have a, a, a variation where you have the post uh, noon time uh, maxima with uh, again you the short term uh, variabilities which are uh, indicative of the uh, uh, wave like oscillations uh, and the uh, the reversed uh, trend on on different uh, nights so these were very uh, interesting uh, 
uh, uh, observations. So what we thought was we tried to to understand why we are having this uh, very different kind of uh, ionospheric uh, variability day to day. We know that it is dependent on the on how the electric field is uh, shaped up, uh, how the, uh, the, the the tidal winds are on a given day. In addition to that, it also depends on uh, what are the prevailing geomagnetic conditions, whether it is uh, quiet or it is disturbed. And uh, in the quiet conditions also, uh, we know because it is a low solar activity uh, uh, phase, so we can have a significant contribution from the uh, from the uh, um, uh, from the prevailing geomagnetic uh, uh, conditions or the solar wind conditions. So what we tried to see was, uh, so we estimated the electric field using these uh, ionospheric drifts and uh, uh, needless to say that the trend in the electric field was also uh, the way we observe the ionospheric uh, drifts that is uh, maximizing at different times of the day. Uh, and uh, slides are not changing, sir. Slides are not changing. Yeah, yes, I, I can see that post noon and reverse on top. Huh? Yeah, now I can see solar wind parameters. Are you? Oh, okay. Slide? I think probably it is slow. Uh, yeah, because of the uh, communication. I don't know whether it is happening with me or uh, everyone else. Uh, the slides are changing uh, fine. Okay. On okay. This All right. Yeah. Fine. Okay, then please go ahead. Yeah. So, uh, so here my intention was to show you. Uh, we we uh, wanted to. So basically, uh, in order to understand these variabilities, we need to look at the uh, magnetospheric uh, variable variations. That is what I was uh, mentioning just now. That uh, these variations could come from the solar wind, magnetosphere, thermosphere, ionosphere coupling. Uh, and uh, a significant part of this uh, variability can also come because of changes uh, happening in the lower atmosphere, essentially through the waves and tides. Uh, waves uh, we can understand because their periodicities are, uh, uh, the time periods involved are much smaller. Uh, so when, when it comes to the trends that we are seeing on, on, on a day to day basis, uh, we thought that we should first need to look at the magnetospheric uh, uh, variations. And it was interesting that the July-August phase of uh, 2021 was uh, not very disturbed, but then there were uh, these uh, streamers, the fast, uh, fast speed streamers, which were uh, which were uh, uh, prevailing, and uh, their effect was seen in terms of the sudden uh, pressure changes and uh, and the solar wind density enhancements. These uh, enhancements you can see they are happening on a at a very periodic uh, level. Uh, so, so with this uh, sort of a uh, uh, background, we uh, we tried to look at the uh, the electric field, the 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 uh, the measured electric field over uh, the uh, over equator, which is uh, indirectly manifesting in the magnetic field, as I uh, told in the beginning, and see the contribution of these interplanetary conditions. And uh, what we saw was that if the interplanetary magnetic field estimated through the solar wind variability, uh, which is uh, the red color, if it is its estimate, if its magnitude is more than 0 0.05 millivolt per meter plus minus, we saw that it has a major contribution or the corresponding variability reflecting in the magnetic field over equator. And that is why I have this uh, the shadowed region is the region which corresponds to plus minus 0 0.05 and you can very clearly see that whenever we see these electric field perturbations the interplanetary electric field perturbations uh, beyond 0 0.05 we are seeing a clear cut indication in the magnetic field on the on the ground over equator so it uh, is clear that we are uh, we are seeing the uh, variability uh, we are seeing the oscillations or the perturbations, the interplanetary perturbations over equatorial ionosphere. But then, most interesting thing was, uh, uh, I would before I show the last slide, I would like to present a, a recent study where uh, Blake et al. Uh, what they have done is based on the ground magnetic field uh, observations, uh, that is uh, also known as the DST observations. They have estimated the equatorial boundary, the maximum equatorial 
uh, latitude the towards the equator the aur auroral boundary which is towards the equator so we call it as equatorial uh, boundary of uh, auroral oval so what what they could uh, show was that you can actually fairly accurately estimate the uh, based on the ground uh, magnetic field perturbations we can fairly accurately estimate the latitude of the magnetic latitude of the equatorward boundary of uh, aurora or the auroral region so what we did was for this phase uh, for the for the july august period we estimated this equatorial boundary of uh, the latitude the magnetic latitude of the equatorial uh, boundary of uh, auroral oval which is indicated by the uh, blue uh, curve here and the electric field that we had estimated uh, using our ionospheric observations over uh, over thumba and what was most uh, surprising was that the the minima on every day that we saw on a day to day uh, basis was very closely corroborating with the variability observed in the auroral oval the equatorial latitude the uh, of the auroral oval you could see that whenever we had a latitude the equatorward uh, movement of the auroral oval we uh, electric field estimate estimated electric field over thumba were low and as the oval moved poleward uh, we see that the magnitude of the electric field uh, uh, over equator is uh, fairly high as you can very clearly see uh, corresponding to uh, day number around 56 57 and uh, the day number uh, 42 43 so this is a very uh, interesting uh, uh, um, uh, observation so the question now is uh, can the auroral oval uh, even in those conditions where we don't have very active uh, auroral perturbations over uh, uh, in the in the polar region can affect the equatorial ionosphere can it affect can it do can it uh, can it uh, influence the equatorial uh, uh, electric field magnitudes the way we observed uh, through through radar Uh, oh, and uh, uh, we are continuing these observations so uh, as the as we get more and more observations uh, we 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 think that the uh, correlation that we are getting between the two uh, will either get strengthened uh, or, or uh, we will get a result otherwise uh, i have a feeling that we are going to get a, a consistent result uh, uh, with this uh, plot so with this uh, question uh, i have uh, come to the uh, end of my uh, presentation and i'll take a question if uh, if there is any okay sir actually i do not see any question listed in our chat box if any anyone is willing to ask any question regarding this presentation please ask we have time for uh, one or two questions yes sarvesh mangala you please go ahead uh, yes sarvesh i am not able to listen their voice yeah it's not uh, audible i see two hands uh, raised yeah. one yeah. is the uh, even shripati and shripati yeah uh, shripati we can yes. take yeah i think we have to hello there mic or no ha ah, yeah yeah they have are you able to hear me now yes 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 dr yes, shripati yes, 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 yes we can hear you yeah nice presentation i just wanted to know your uh, this 18 mega frequency uh, hf radar long back also some uh, studies were done now whether it is operational yes 18 mega hertz radar is operational now actually uh, okay. it has uh, now we are using it uh, on a more uh, day to day basis okay uh, and as you said it right um, uh, it was uh, it was actually it had been there uh, for last 20 years uh, yeah, and operating yeah. on and off oh okay okay yes. very nice and actually even from uh, this uh, ionosonde we use it to get the doppler drift uh, these yeah. drifts in fact we compared with even your uh, trivandrum uh, ionosonde and it was matching very well So whether yeah. some uh, uh, correlative studies uh, can be done whenever you are 18 mega frequency operational? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, it'll be it'll be very nice actually uh, to complement it with yes, uh, more yes, more yes, more observations. Yes. yes. So In fact, we'll daytime uh, daytime drifts uh, we get from the caddy is also yeah. uh, lower frequency because it has an impact of. Uh, 
recombinations and all so yeah, how uh, uh, yes uh, we can get uh, uh, eliminated by this uh, recombination effects and uh, yes. photoionization effects and yes. how we can compare with uh, actual observations actual drift whether we can get that sure. is what is my question is sure we can we can actually we can uh, compare with the uh, digisond uh, uh, observations yeah. and yeah. Uh, yeah. we because we already have a, some sort of a theoretical estimate Hmm. It's around uh, five to ten meters per second. Uh, that is the typical, uh, the apparent drift we observe due to chemistry. Hmm. Uh, so we can actually, um, we can actually observe uh, or or see uh, what the radar uh, indicates. Yeah, yeah, yes. And also, you see uh, PRE drifts in the evening sector. Sorry, uh, say it again. Pre reversal enhancement in the pre reversal enhancement is. Uh, um, I'll have to check because. Uh. Okay, what we yes. do is whenever we are uh, operating uh, towards the evening, mm. uh, we operate it slightly later uh, for oh, ESF. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, because uh, daytime echoes so, completely uh, die down around five thirty six. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, Doctor okay. Shivati, I think we can uh, discuss later more. Yeah. One yeah, or two yeah, more sure, questions sure. we'll take. Uh, just maybe, uh, Sarvesh, if you are available right now, please ask. Uh, he's not able to. Maybe uh, un you can Anybody unmute yourself. Yeah, yeah. One question we will take, sir. Anybody else who is uh, right now on online? Hi. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah, please. Okay. Uh, thank you for the very Hello. interesting talk, uh, sir. So I have one question uh, yeah. that you showed in your last slide that the correlation between the uh, equatorial strength of current density and the boundary layer of uh, auroral region. So, uh, what could be the uh, like reason for that uh, particular correlation? Yes, yeah, that's uh, that's a very important question. Actually, uh, you have asked the uh, the crux of the uh, problem. Uh, what we feel is uh, actually there have been indications in the past that uh, uh, we the kind of uh, current system we have uh, we call it a global current system. Okay, uh, so um, when we uh, observe the magnetic changes over equator or the ionospheric drifts over equator, it is not just the electric field or perturbations uh, or the electric field over equator, but these currents are also a part of a global current system uh, where a significant contribution comes from uh, polar latitudes. So, uh, so probably we will have to uh, sort of demarcate the local contribution versus the global contribution. There have been a few papers, a uh, uh, few very important papers. Uh, Professor Gurubaran has uh, done a, a modeling study using a TIE GCM uh, observations and the magnetic field uh, uh, study long back, uh, where he had indicated that uh, this uh, current system, the electrojet current system, it's a part of a global current system. So probably the answer lies uh, in this, uh, in this, um, what should I say, scientific uh, framework. Uh, that is all I can say right now. Yeah, it okay. is actually integrated effect what we see. Uh, so yes. yeah, there, there are other components which needs to be. Uh, exactly, exactly. And yeah, and exactly. And then Correct. different time intervals, uh, there are different kind of components which are coming and disappearing again. True. So, yeah. True. I think then we are uh, done with uh, uh, questions. Uh, anybody you. is willing to ask any question, please type in chat box. Uh, we will be happy to answer the questions which are concerned to this talk. Uh, shall we move to next talk, sir? Yes, I think we should move to uh, next uh, presenter. Yeah. Okay. Okay, sir. Then thank you very much. I thank uh, Dr. Tanpan for his very nice talk on uh, the. Uh, we have seen after a long time these results from equatorial radar, and we are we are happy, and we will wish that uh, this thing continue in future as well. Uh, and next presenter is uh, Dr. Janardhan Reddy, uh, Sri Janardhan Reddy. Uh, he would be presenting on new data analysis tool on Digisonde observations for scientific investigations. So uh, I request uh, Dr. Janardhan Reddy to share his talk. Please okay. share your presentation, Janardhan. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. 
सर इट इज इज इट ओके सर ना या या प्लीज गो अहेड या डॉक्टर अनुन टू वन एंड ऑल आई एम जनार्दन रेड्डी वर्किंग एज एन इंजीनियर इन एनआरएल टुडे माय टॉपिक फॉर प्रेजेंटेशन इज न्यू डेटा एनालिसिस टूल ऑन डिजीज ऑन डे ऑब्जर्वेशंस फॉर साइंटिफिक इन्वेस्टिगेशंस बैकग्राउंड एज यू नो डिजीज ऑन डे वी हैव बीन यूजिंग सिंस लॉन्ग बैक फॉर रायनोस्पेरिक रिसर्च which is working on the plasma frequency reflection principle so at present we are using the latest digis on the version at gadanki which has four receiving uh, antennas with interferometric capability so actually we have not we thought we have not used digis on the with full potential so in order to <coughs> demonstrate some of the untapped potential of digis on the we have developed some specific analysis tool to study the ionosphere uh, with uh, to to full capability so i will be explaining some of the investigations what we have done using the dg sonda data either with uh, ionogram data and with the doppler data which consists of spectral spectral data so i will be explaining first about the ionogram ionogram data and its uses and its uh, potential to ex uh, explain the ionospheric uh, characteristics so first actually we have extra, uh, we have extracted the raw ionogram data which you can see in the first panel in the left so that we have then we have applied some noise removal technique so that we can clearly see the echoes which is the background and which is the signal <coughs> as a function of frequency and height then in the third panel i have done some uh, f layer extraction with some uh, uh, <coughs> in uh, curve fitting type which will be used for wave analysis so the wave analysis i will be explaining the further slides that fourth slide i, I have put with uh, uh, <coughs> uh, extracted trace along with the main f f, f trace so when we have ionograms with a function of local time so it will clearly demonstrate uh, ionospheric ambient and disturbed states as we can see uh, this this two panels are indicating range time displays of frequency and its corresponding snr as a function of time we can clear see uh, clearly see upper side uh, it is showing plasma frequency with virtual height and its corresponding snr from 90 to 20 we can clearly see this is the disturbed states of ionosphere so why we are telling we have compared this with the uh, co located 30 megahertz giri radar this i am showing here we can see this plume structures well correlated with uh, co, uh, co, co located 30 megahertz giri radar even we can see during that plume structures snr will be comparatively low uh, compared to Uh, normal ionospheric conditions you see this uh, 22 to uh, 2 o'clock that local time that is a normal uh, undisturbed states of ionosphere whereas we can see this 19 to 22 this is these are the plume structures and these are the disturbed states so what we we have we have compared with a co located uh, instrument so we can use this analysis tool as a uh, limited sense like if the radar observations are not available we can use this range time displays as a one tool for measuring the ionospheric background conditions and uh, ambient and disturbed states of ionosphere so next i will go wave analysis actually wave analysis why we have to do before that pre sunset time the whatever the waves will be present it will be man manifesting the uh, uh, manifesting for the generation of a plasma bubble so we have to study these waves whether uh, what is the direction of waves and what is the scale sizes so in order to do that generally we used to do manual scaling with the help of uh, sao explorer to mitigate that we we have developed an auto scaling algorithm with the extracted raw data so uh, <coughs> manual scaling data and automatic scaling whatever the virtual height parameters we have extracted using this algorithm we have compared with uh, the both data and you can see very clearly uh, uh, very clear comparison between at automatic and manual scaling data this manual uh, this both uh, from this both parameters we, i have done some uh, residual height variations of automatic uh, scaling and manual scaling we can see very clear wave propagation in both cases so instead of using this uh, manual scaling method 
we have developed uh, this automatic scaling algorithm to save the time and even <coughs> you can pick up any frequency at your wish otherwise generally if you go for manual scaling it will take more time uh, even for each each frequency so we have developed this algorithm for to mitigate the time uh, to save the time and uh, increase your uh, computation analysis so generally we use this wave analysis with respect to height variations of any fixed frequency generally so what we have done here we have done uh, wave uh, this wave variations with residual density structures so we can clearly see wave, wave propagation in both uh, fix, uh, fixed frequency height variation and fixed height uh, residual density variation we can see 15.2 local time uh, this wave propagation we, we can see and one more point to be noted here is the anti correlation between uh, fixed height residual variation and fixed height fixed frequency height variation where residual density is high uh, this uh, residual uh, residual density is low uh, residual height variation at fixed frequency is low residual density is more so we can use residual density variation also for wave studies so in, uh, in continuation to that, I have computed uh, this periodicities for both residual density variation and residual height variation. Even uh, periodicities are well matching. So you can use residual density variation or residual height variation at fixed frequency for wave analysis, which will be man which will use for manifestation of our uh, plasma bubble. So when we have these waves we should also have the direction in which direction it is moving and what is the exact uh, echo center direction of this wave so in order to do the in order to study that we we need to have angle of arrival of each frequency and each height so we have developed uh, we we have developed an analysis tool for this also using doppler uh, doppler data so we can see this is the receiver schematic at, at present uh, in kadanki location each receiver is located at this uh, uh, at the edges edges of equilateral triangle with uh, 60 meters and one is at the centroid of uh, triangle so we have employed uh, some interferometry analysis so this is the methodology so delta m1 is the phase difference between the receiver 2 and 1 m, m, m is where 2 3 are 2 3 and 4 one is the re reference antenna we, we we have to measure the phase difference between uh, 2 and 1 3 and 1 4 and 1 accordingly we have to solve the equation so that you will get both azimuth and zenith angles then you can get exact location of inospheric sources where, where, where in which direction it is moving and which direction it is locating locating so sample observations for uh, this uh, angle of arrival i have done in uh, we have showed in sky map this we this show uh, sky map you can see first sky map uh, with the uh, corresponding uh, inogram this is coming from the vertical direction you can see this is the undisturbed states of inosphere whereas you can see second panel is the, it is the spread of time you can clearly see it is coming around 12 to 14 degrees so we, uh, this tool will be useful whether your i know uh, your uh, our inosphere is disturbed states or uh, uh, normal state so with, with the continuation of this uh, wave analysis and this angle of arrival data we, we have we have also we have also estimated some parameters with the wave like variations in density structures so you, you can see this is the residual density variation on a particular day we can very clearly see this slow propagation from 15 to 19 local time hours uh, with this uh, we have uh, uh, we have extracted some parameters of waves like periodicity vertical wavelength horizontal wavelength now we have the parameters and we should know the angle of arrival uh, direction also for this so we have extracted the angle of arrival of corresponding echoes each each sky map is showing composite uh, sky map like uh, this is the mix of like two, uh, some sky maps uh, for each duration which is mentioned uh, at, at the top of sky map so we can clearly see uh, from down to up the down to up the echo centers are moving slightly eastward so this tool is also useful to measure the propagation direction along with the uh, characteristic parameters of the waves which will be used for uh, 
calculating the manifestation of this uh, uh, disturbed states of ionosphere so we have also done some analysis on aspect angle of esf echoes so we can clearly see uh, the we have plotted frequency frequency dependence of this zenith angle during the spread of time during spread of spread of time mostly uh, esf echoes are supposed to come around at gadangis are supposed to come around 14 degrees but he, but here uh, we are not clearly getting so this may be because of refraction or echoes are yeah, coming, you have two more minutes yes sir yes sir or okay. this this may be coming from the angle where wherever that perpendicularity is being uh, satisfied so here you see uh, uh, echoes are coming from much wider zenith angle it is not like backscatter uh, backscatter redus where we will be getting uh, that uh, <clears throat> not 14 degrees or 15 degrees at gadanki so this this further needs to be studied this is this study is uh, going on so in total what i would like to sell uh, whatever the data analysis tool we have developed uh it is useful for the studies of wave analysis along with the propagation direction and its manifestation linked to plasma bubbles so this is the summary we have developed an analysis tool for dg sunday observations this range time displays whatever we are giving getting from the dg sunday will also be used uh, as a uh, Uh, like backscatter radar when radar observations are not available this dg sunday data can also be used to study wave like variation structures which includes gravity waves and tids and their propagation propagation direction aspect angle which we are getting for esf echoes are much wider compared to meter scale irregularities thank you sir over okay okay thank you uh, janardan uh, जनार्दन I see is not clear, sir. Uh, yeah, I am. I am also telling same. Sir, why is is not audible? Okay, I will ask you. Yeah, the Subir, box. you are not audible. Okay, I will ask. Yeah, you, you can type box. in chat box. If any other question is there, we will take next one. Ah. Uh, Uh, there are no further questions, uh, Janardan. I have one clarification. Sir, sir, sir. Uh, our Rhino Sunday beam is a uh, very wide beam, isn't it? Y yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. So, so how do you perform interferometry within beam? Sir, actually, it is not in beam, sir. Whatever echoes we are receiving from Rhino Sphere. Yeah. Ah, uh, so. You see, like in radar, sir. Actually, it is not also in beam interferometry, sir. Okay, okay. So here it is not in beam interferometry, sir. Whatever the echoes okay. we are. Uh, angle of arrival is connected with each echo, so you are trying to see from that point of view. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, okay. Okay. Hello. Can I ask questions? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Please yeah, tell me. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. I am Sripati speaking. Yes, yeah, sir. Please. Sir. Tell me. Tell me, sir. Yeah, uh, nice presentation. Uh, good uh, work you are doing. So okay. I just wanted to know you are uh, only talking about uh, virtual heights, right? What about the real heights? Yes. Sir, real heights we have not converted those virtual heights into real heights. Mm. So as of now, we have we have been trying to do analysis with virtual heights. So that is yet to be uh, do some analysis for mm -hmm. that question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so how you are? Uh, how, is it uh, individual uh, frequency you are taking and then filtering and uh, then doing it? Which one, sir? Which one? Uh, you have shown uh, that uh, different uh, frequencies uh, oscillations, right? Wave oscillation. Yes, yes, sir. That is individual frequency we are picking up with local time hmm. for all the inograms, whatever we have for the time duration. Hmm. So this then. For uh, uh, this one, okay. 
yes sir for the decision whatever the frequency you want you can pick up sir otherwise we have to do manual scaling which will mm. take lot of time actually suppose yeah, if you are yeah, for yeah, 5 yeah. megahertz yeah if yeah your signal yeah. is not there again yeah, you have to go for 5.5 mm, okay. mm, so mm, uh, th- then then it will save your time and yeah, even rational analysis correct. you can check for so many frequencies correct where that wave propagation is there okay. yeah 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 okay. i think good Shripati, if you are clear, then we'll yeah, go for yeah, the I, I am clear. question yeah. by Subir. He is typing, Janardhan, you please listen to me. Yes, sir, uh, yes, sir. Can you elaborate how you developed auto-scaling algorithm? I mean, he want to say what are the inputs? Sir, actually, uh, for auto-scaling algorithm, first we need to have raw data. Raw data yes. means as a function of frequency and virtual height. Okay. So now you want to pick up at particular time, let us assume. Let us assume 12 o'clock. At okay. for particular inogram, you select like 5 megahertz, for example. Okay. 5 megahertz, you see, when you see the trace in F region, yeah. it will have with uh, some SNR fluctuations, like uh, with some 2-3 uh, range bins, it will have signal like 30 dB, 32 dB, 35 dB, let us assume, an okay. example. Yeah, so yeah. now, you, when you want to pick the virtual height for that frequency, you have to select higher SNR dB point. Yeah, there is a threshold, yeah, correct. Yes. It is not threshold, sir. Higher SNR point you have to pick up. Okay. We should we should not fix any threshold. Okay, fine. Whatever the SNR you have to pick higher SNR for that particular frequency. Okay. Suppose okay. if you have suppose if you have two three range bins, let us assume uh, 300, 302.5, 305, with yes. the all same SNRs, then you have to mean that the three heads. Okay. Okay. That's so what we have done. Stronger, stronger echo is uh, like you believe that uh, particular uh, signal and associated perturbations. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, yeah. Anyway, so, this uh, algorithm uh, is a very detailed one. I think uh, you can also reply to him in chat box. Okay. Okay, sir. No issue. Uh, okay. Uh, Am I clear? Yeah. Am I clear, yeah, sir? I think, I think you starting point is clear from your algorithm, but since algorithm has several uh, parts, <laughs> yes, so uh, at this moment, I think uh, we can go into discussion mode. It will be difficult. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, and there are no more questions, I think. So, uh, so I will then move to next uh, presentation. Thank you, Janardhan, for your okay. presentation. Okay. Okay. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, next presentation is uh, by Mr. Sarvesh Mangala. Uh, it is on equatorial ionospheric study using GMRT. GMRT, as we know, is uh, the GMRT at uh, uh, TIFR developed by a facility by TIFR and uh, still uh, another one more presentation on uh, use of radar for ionosphere space weather studies. Let us listen from Sarvesh. Can you see my slides? Yeah, we can hear you, but your presentation. Uh, yeah, now go for full screen, please. Yeah, still. <coughs> That's fine. You can start now. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, myself, Sarvesh Mangla from IIT Indore. Thanks for the opportunity to be given to me at the to present my uh, slides at sim- uh, this symposium. As there are many instruments you know to study the ionosphere, in recent decade one more is introduced into the list which is radio telescope and I am here to present my work with GMRT. Uh, as ionosphere is a critical link between the chain of uh, sun-earth interaction, the degree of ionization varies significantly with time, geographic location, day to night cycle and in which season you are measuring it and also on the sunspot cycle. To measure ionospheric activity, one measure the total electron content, which is, uh, but in reality, one can only measure the slant tech, which is obtained along the line of sight to the target, which can be either a satellite or any astronomical source. As we observe the target in low frequency in the radio band, the ionosphere turned out to be quite an obstacle. Like JMRT, an interferometer measure uh, time average correlation of the complex electric fields measured by any antenna pair pointed at an astronomical source. As these are sensitive to ionosphere-induced path differences, there is an additional phase 
uh, is introduced which is directly proportional to differential tech along the line of sight. So to make a good observation, one should calibrate out the ionosphere corruption. The same calibrated data can give insight into the ionosphere. So here my work start on. So this is what an interferometer measure and this is G uh, is the instrumental noise and this is an extra phase term that is induced because of the ionosphere. For a cold collisionless plasma, the total propagation delay that is measured using a radio telescope, but as interferometer measure uh, differential phase, we get differential tech from the data. This is the layout of the GMRT, which is located near Pune, where 16, uh, 16 dishes are in the arms and 14 are in the central square with a maximum baseline of 25 km, where a max, uh, baseline is uh, the distance between uh, antenna pairs. Our chosen data, our chosen target is a 3C68, is a radio, uh, a radio galaxy, which is observed at 610 megahertz. So uh, when we uh, like reduce the data in CASA or any, um, there are many, uh, uh, many software to reduce the data and we get the diff phase difference between two antenna pair and this phase difference is given by this equation where additional phase error are also present uh, with the ionosphere. So like instrumental error, there is a structure of the source and the two pi ambiguity. So uh, the dominating uh, part is ionosphere and instrumental. So we have to remove each effect to get the ionospheric phase. The 2 pi ambiguity can be dealt with by unwrapping the phase and uh, the pi structure are already been removed during the self calibration procedure. And to remove the instrumental noise, we have uh, applied a process called continuum subtraction method. Uh, uh, yeah. To eliminate the instrumental noise, we have divided the data into two bands, uh, for, uh, the 610 megahertz into two bands 605 and 614. Uh, we have treated the ionospheric fluctuations as superimposed on a smooth continuum consistent of uh, instrumental noise. Uh, by scaling this way, the, um, by scaling this way, the ionospheric phases were removed and the and the remaining difference of instrumental phases was further fitted with the linear combination of spatial frequency u and v. Thus, continuum subtraction phase are the instrumental noise that we subtracted from each band and each antenna. Once we get the differential phase after removing the instrumental noise, we use the equation to convert the, the differential phase to differential tech for each time step and then each band. After that, we took the mean for the two bands and we get the differential tech measured for each antenna that is plotted in black as a function of time. These are the plot for the central square antennas. For each time step and antenna, we have plot also plotted the median absolute deviation, which is in red, along with the four nearest time step, which will minimize the effect of any uh, bad data which remain. So we, uh, we took the median absolute deviation using the four time step. The un uncertainty presented by the MAD computation is around millitech unit, uh, which show the remarkable ability of GMRT to detect uh, extremely small tech fluctuations. Uh, these are the plot for each arm antenna, where you can see the solution are getting the same pattern along their direction and also scaling with the antenna distance. Uh, with that of the reference antenna, we have to take a reference antenna to do the, the analysis and uh, by scale, uh, as these are scaling with the uh, with the baseline length, that differential tech is to be proportional to be baseline length. Thus, measuring that gradient is necessary to understand behavior of any anospheric phenomena. We have uh, we have applied two basic uh, geometric correction to the data before measuring the tech gradient, which will correspond to vertical tech gradient as closely as possible over the full array. First, to project the antenna pattern onto the location where the line of sight of the antenna passes through the ionosphere. The second correction is to compute the slant to vertical tech correction for the line of sight of the target. In the figure, uh, in the top panel, you can see the peak height as a function of time, which was estimated using the IRI plus software. In the middle panel, uh, for each of the furthest antenna in the arm, the projected baseline distance is plotted as a function of time. And then in the bottom panel, the multiplicative factor that is used to convert the uh, observed slant tech into vertical differential tech. After applying uh, the geometric correction to the antenna position and the 
differential tech measurement we sought to characterize the two dimensional tech gradient at, uh, at each antenna at each time step since the array is smaller than any transient ionospheric phenomena we have chosen the second and third order uh, taylor series that can approximate the amount of tech surface detected by gmrt we have used the difference between the differential tech for each of the 351 baselines as there are uh, n antennas and four were flagged those 26 antenna you can and c2 uh, 350 unique base antenna pair to compute the coefficient of polynomial fit from p0 to p8 and for second order is p0 to p4 uh, as you can see in both the second order as well as in the third order fit the fluctuation in tech is mostly visible in the p1 coefficient the amplitude is very high which is a partial derivative along the east west direction also higher order uh, terms you can see that they are more significant during the night time so at uh, on that day uh, the around 5:30 the sun came up so with the polynomial based method uh, provide useful information about the variation of full tag gradient they but they neglect the ability, ability to detect small scale fluctuations thus we opted to measure the projected tag gradient using a complementary method uh, lagrangian interpolation method uh, in th Uh, this method was only applied uh, along each arm as the antenna in the central square are randomly placed uh, we uh, uh, those uh, those antennas were placed in one of the three arms and uh, thus the projected tag gradient was computed at uh, each time step for uh, the antenna of each arm by using a three point lagrangian interpolation method we have also plotted the projected tag gradient that was obtained using the second order polynomial and as well as the third order polynomial fit the second order is in red and the third order is in green for larger amplitude and longer period disturbances the polynomial fit recover the structure but after certain uh, al uh, distance along the arm the second order fail to recover any structure whatsoever but during the night time a significant amount of tech surface uh, tech fluctuations are missed by both the polynomial fit which is being only observed by using the individual antenna tech gradient for shortest uh, particularly for the shortest baseline near the center of the array uh, so here is the summary of my talk and uncertainty present in the uh, differential tech measurement were is around uh, millitech unit which show the ability to of gmrt uh, the polynomial based method is able to recover the properties associated with large larger disturbances as they pass over the array the third order fit uh, is a better fit for the small scale fluctuations but during the night time the smaller scale fluctuations were missed especially for the shortest baselines the projected tech gradient at each antenna has shown that there are smaller scale fluctuation observed throughout the night and also we are doing the spectral analysis on the data to like uh, verify uh, to get the the wave structures the time period the, the direction what they are moving on okay sarvesh uh, have you completed your presentation yes sir okay just one quick uh, clarification before any question comes out uh, uh, you have uh, Uh, taken the gmrt data and uh, the delta tech measurements uh, which are uh, as observed from the gmrt different uh, different antenna pattern uh, yes, have you have you validated uh, any time any particular day or, or any particular hour uh, what perturbations you are getting are physical i mean using any other gps receiver or any other source have there you are not uh, yeah i i want to do but there are not G, uh, uh, during that that time that the the data this data was taken there was not a gps receiver uh, near pune actually and okay. the receivers that are uh, i i is station that is located in bangalore there's the only okay. sole station that the data was present but uh, only one data and the latitude and longitude is much different so it will not be a good Uh, okay i have one suggestion here that uh, yes, since sir. you are uh, since your perturbations are the order of less than 1 tc unit mostly mm -hmm. uh, that will uh, that is like a noise in tc at that level in uh, you you will require very precise uh, gnss receiver to even yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. qualify yeah. for that validation one thing second thing is that uh, right now uh, even if you don't have a receiver at pune 
but uh, maybe receiver at another location will do the cause as far as your amplitude perturbation and their uh, validation of the what you are getting is a uh, uh, what you call the time series uh, but again these are like mostly noise level mostly noise level and gravity waves of any kind can perturb or even the system based parameters can perturb uh, how do you really see that they are tc i mean still that question is there they are part of the ionospheric tc or uh, noise uh, until we get the like confirmation there always yeah, a yeah. doubt yeah, even yeah. Is, there will be doubt yeah. But the Correct. spectral analysis and we uh, in the spectral analysis that we have performed, I have not presented here because the work is not completed yet. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, in that we like uh, able to characterize the medium scale TIDs that were present, and uh, we have to validate uh, uh, the data that uh, in the if we get the data uh, at the uh, at different frequency. Yeah, yeah. So in different frequency, it will not be an instrumental noise, right? Because exactly. the the receive uh, the the band filter will be different for yeah, different frequency. Different frequency, you can have an ionospheric common origin. That is okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Ah, so so what I'm asking last query, uh, yes, that when you tell about an MSTID or even a larger scale structure, uh, actually what you are getting on uh, uh, x-axis is your uh, uh, what is your sampling interval? Uh, maybe few seconds. This is 0 0.5 second, but we have ah. averaged the data for 10 ah. seconds to get okay. the ah. good so result. That differential measurement is coming every 10 seconds. So that is like very high frequency perturbations you are right now uh, able to see in the differential TEC. Yes. And now, now if these perturbations are lying on background of the MSTID, then how would you know? Uh, that is my question no 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 it's like uh, you um, as i already told that uh, dif uh, the antenna can only measure differential tag exactly. but there is uh, but there is a uh, like in the uh, in the mathematical formulation you can like uh, convert into because if there are linear features then it's only multiplication with the frequency right okay okay but uh, if we take the assumption, we you can like uh, switch back to differential tech to tech, and then you can see the parameters. Okay, okay, but in okay. the equation that you have see, there is no yeah. constant term, okay. so uh, you can't see that. Uh, I I think you can see my I mouse. No, no, I understand your argument. I understand. Yeah. Uh, we will take a quick question from Professor Ashik Paul. Yes. Sir, sir. Can you listen me? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Please go ahead. Ravish, it's an interesting. Uh, Presentation. Could you just go to that uh, slide where you showed the differential TEC in different frames? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, this is for the along the different arms. No, that one where you know that. Uh, My name? No, not this one. The one you were this showing that. Uh, this one? No, no, no. Okay, sorry. Okay, okay, okay. Bring to any one of them where right? the red line. Yeah. Is, yeah. So one of my questions is that what is the noise flow of this uh, receiving system that you are using? Because you see, you are uh, you are uh, showing the differential TEC, which are of the order of like 0 0.02 TEC units. Okay. So what I would like to uh, ask is that depending on the noise flow of the receiver, whether it's a DPS receiver or any kind of other radio receiver. That noise flow identification is very important. That means whether these jitters, whether they are, uh, you know, coming from the receiver hardware itself or from actual ionospheric sources. So that identification or that classification becomes very important. So what is the noise flow in this case? Do you have any idea of the receiver? Yeah, Ravesh, have you characterized the noise? That is what Sar is asking. Yes, yes, I got the question. And uh, the the thing is that uh, when uh, the ins the noise that uh, yeah. he's talking about is coming for the image uh, when we make an image that the noise level in the image plane is also a considerable factor okay. to get the differential tech measurements so yeah. in the in this uh, uh, around um, in the image plane i i remember the part that uh, it's around uh, 10 10 microjansky the level was down to 10 microjansky Okay, so you are talking about signal to noise ratio within when you have observation from individual antenna, is it? Uh, from the whole interferometer, not okay, the individual okay. antenna. Okay, map. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay. But I, I will look into it and I will get back exactly, to you. Exactly, yeah. Professor Paul is telling that you characterize the particular uh, noise in your data and then you try to show what you are showing as anospheric signature or whatever signature for that matter. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Paul. Uh, I think then with this, we, uh, we are completing this presentation. We, I will move to next presentation now. Uh, uh, I invite... Uh, uh, Shri Moho Mosarak Mohsen from SPL Space Physics Laboratory VSSC Trivandrum uh, to present a talk on thermospheric neutral winds and temperature. First results from an Indian equatorial station. Uh, Nirvikar, uh, there is one yes. more presentation uh, in between uh, by Tanmay Das. Tanmay Das, okay. Yes. yes. Tanmay, are you ready? Yes, yes, yes sir. Okay, okay, then uh, let us have this presentation. Uh, uh, observation of summer nighttime FAI field aligned irregularity using University of Calcutta ST radar by Tanmay Das. Yes. Uh, you, you please share your screen. I request uh, next presenter to be ready. Is it okay, sir? Uh, I'm not able to see your presentation. Yeah, now his screen is visible. Can you go for full screen mode? Yes. Yes, sir. I have done it. Yeah. No, uh, so now it's okay. Now, yeah, you have now 12 minutes for presentation and please spare three minutes for uh, some questions. Please go ahead. Okay. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Good afternoon, everybody. Myself, Tanmay Das, uh, now going to present some interesting observation during summer night time field alignment irregularity by University of Calcutta State Data. These are the outlines of my presentation. It's uh, divided into introduction, radar specification, present status of this radar, data and methodology, results, conclusion, acknowledgement of references. First, we come to know that uh, Calcutta University have the historic ionospheric observatory. It's located at the Harin Gata which is 50 kilometers north east of the Kolkata and uh, comparatively low noise area. And this is very much interesting, this place, because it's situated at the transition region of the tropic of subtropical region, because this is the for the lower atmosphere study. This place is very important, as well as for the ionospheric study. This is more important because this place is uh, situated at the northern crest of the ionization anomaly with a magnetic deep of 36.2 degree north. This is the radar specification. Uh, in this, uh, all earlier in a talk, I have already mentioned it. I am not going in detail about that. This radar is a 53 megahertz radar in a university curriculum. This is the first radar in our India, as well as Asian longitude and South Asian longitude sector. We planned this radar will be go for the port 75 three element Yagi antennas with beam steering up to obtaining angle of 40, 40 degree from the Janet. And it's uh, this radar divided into 25 subarray and each subarray consists of 19 EIG elements. These are the outputs of the our radar. This is the present status of our radar. Almost uh, out of 475 uh, EIG antenna elements, uh, almost 430 have been done. Within uh, a couple of uh, weeks, we have been complete. Uh, we will see the complete array in our system but in present observation we consider one sub array only one sub array which is called as the cust pilot array 
this is a 19 element uh, Yagi antenna and this sub array can um, uh, tilt the beam up to 30 degree, maximum 30 degree. But in case of our main array, it will be tilted up to 40 degree. So these are the output we used to get from this uh, pilot array. Signal to noise ratio, as well as range time intensity and range time velocity. This radar is operational since uh, April 2018. This, this is the schematic diagram of the main array. It is a semi-circular uh, array. And this is the one particular sub-array we have to use. This is the pilot sub-array. During this observation, we use this sub-array. This is the control and instrumentation room. When the morphology of the ionospheric irregularity to observe from our station, just at the post sunset hour, the ionospheric irregularity generate at the equatorial region and due to E cross B drift, it's the plasma uh, go upward and, uh, and it's transferred to the magnetic field line through the, through the magnetic field line, it's go to the off equatorial region. So, so, from a particular direction, from the uh, we uh, ob to observe this uh, ionospheric irregularity, we uh, have to um, fulfill the orthogonality criteria from our location. So, it, it is uh, the orthogonality criteria from our location is 36.2 degree. But uh, in our case, the beam width is 18 degree, and it's uh, like maximum it can be tilted up to 30 degrees. So. During this observation of uh, 2019 and uh, summer month of the 2019 and 2020, we uh, consider these radar beams into five different objective angle of 23, 25, 27, 28, and 20, uh, 30 degree with a resolution of 1.2 kilometer. But in case of uh, 2020, we consider in a particular um, beam of 30 degree towards the north to observe the ionospheric backscatter through our CUST radar. This is the schematic diagram. If we go, this is the magnetic field line. If when the irregular to comes through the magnetic field line uh, from the equator region, then this, if we go through this direction, then we only receive the backscatter when the orthogonality criteria is fulfilled from our place. This is the data radar parameters we used during the observation of 2019 and 20. Number of regimen we have used 180 of a 50 points, 512. The coherent integration we have used is 8, and incoherent integration is 4 with the interpulse period of 2000. And the number of beams which I have mentioned during the 2019, we used the 5 of Jenny's angle, and in case of 2020, it's for a particular direction. And we also consider the, uh, from the DSTX, we also consider the, those cases. Uh, generally, we uh, in a magnetic uh, quiet days, during the summer months, we got the backscatter echo. These are the records we got uh, during this observation of summer months of May. This is a sample cases. During the early, we operate the radar from the early evening and post sunset hours, and it uh, continues at the early morning. Here, some echoes we received from our radar is it's uh, around uh, post sunset hours is started, and it continues up to uh, almost uh, um, late. Uh, night of uh, 2020 and this case is uh, very important because the uh, from our location it's uh, this kind of echoes we observe between the 120 to 140 kilometer of altitude and corresponding the uh, range time velocity we observe the maximum of range velocity at the early evening hours of 32 meter per second this is the cases we observe 
this kind of similar kind of high field irregularity on the month of May, the number of each six. So May 16, we observed the around 20 hours. This is uh, the echo around 140 kilometers of height. But uh, in other day of May 20 and 21, this echoes as a continuous and uh, it uh, continues up to post midnight hours also. In case of month of uh, June 2019, we got the 10 days of similar this kind of field in alignment irregularity. This is one sample case of June uh, 10th of June. The ionospheric backscattered is, is started around uh, 7, 19, 50 hours and it continues up to post midnight also. These are the corresponding uh, normalized spectra. Normalized Doppler spectra we observed for the 130 kilometers around 1950 RST. This kind of observation we have made for the 10 days, as I have mentioned. And uh, for the month of March uh, in, uh, 2019 and um, 2020, the only one uh, cases we observed during the month of uh, March. 2019 and uh, as well as 2020, the echoes generally observed uh, the uh, post uh, post sunset hours around 20 hours for the case of uh, 20 March 4, 4, 4 so March 2020, but uh, in case of March uh, 25th 2019, the echoes are. Uh, quite high, around 150 kilometers of height, he received this echo with a strong SNR value. This kind of field alignment irregularity generally we observe from our location during the summer daytime as well as the winter night time. These are the cases uh, we observe during the summer daytime of uh, February 22nd of 2019 and for November 28th of uh, 2018. These are the cases generally observed from our location. But uh, what we have observed, this is the first time for the uh, summer uh, night time, E region equals we observe from our CUST radar. Uh, for that region, is most important. So I conclude in this um, uh, presentation in such a way. The most uh, important of Eritrean summer nighttime echoes, which is confined to altitude of 110 to 145 kilometers, with a SNR value of uh, minus 15 to 20 dB, which implies of echo of uh, 20 to 30 dB higher than the background noise. As well as uh, in our uh, Doppler spectra, which we observe is a type 2 in nature, that is the broad spectra with smaller Doppler shift are believed to be linked to turbulent process of gradient drift of instability origin with the Doppler velocity in the range of minus 90 to 120 meters per second. And this uh, field alignment irregularities are most of the descending in nature with the patchiness and there is um, also day to day variety variation is observed so i conclude my presentation here these are the our publication we have uh, first time published from our book in this paper uh, we received the e region irregularities, but in case of uh, this, generally we mentioned that the uh, month of July and month of August, we observed some field and irregularity of e region, which we have uh, communicated before and published in the Radio Science paper. 
and i acknowledge uh, the acrb for the funding for this radar i would like um, uh, thanks to our uh, colleague p nanda kumar uh, bindu jana and gopal singh for their support during the radar experiment and these are the references um, thank you thank you uh, uh, thank you tanmay uh, if there are any questions we have quick one or two questions at the max i do not see any hand raising tanmay are you able to listen to me yes sir yes sir okay uh, just one clarification that uh, uh, since it is kind of inospec uh, beam that you are using so how do you uh, find that your beam is perpendicular to the magnetic field for uh, uh, getting the echo from the field align irregularities yes sir uh, in our case uh, before we calculate the particular direction of the magnetic beam is 30.6.2 but in our case the other other direction we operate the radar in um, in before that and uh, yeah. no, no. i am asking that how do you know that your beam when you are switching is uh, perpendicular to the magnetic field yes uh, for our pilot array it's uh, the beam width is very high now it's 18 degree beam width so uh, the beam width of... beam width can be even pencil beam or wider beam but uh, the main lobe the center of the beam uh, generally should be perpendicular to the magnetic field line at your kolkata so yeah. uh, i mean from haringata so yeah. maybe uh, you you may look into it how how you, how you have estimated and calculated that angle Yes, yeah, Shripati, please, a uh, very quick question. Okay. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to know, uh, you have shown uh, E region stuff. What about uh, F region? Do you see any spread of uh, echoes? Not yet, sir, because for F region, I uh, needed some uh, strong, but now not so much uh, echoes we observe. Because uh, in our pilot array, it's only the 19 element pilot array. Hmm. so only one server is uh, the number power will be more in case of a main array so for that uh, that time we we probably will receive obviously we will receive some f region and uh, solar activity also is increasing now so for yeah. the coming years or uh, we probably will, uh, will get some f region equals but still now no f region equals we have been observed okay because of the latitude and all higher latitude maybe uh, that uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah correct okay yes, so yes, yes. Uh, i think then with this uh, uh, i i call this uh, particular uh, presentation over thank you tanmay for presenting nice talk thank uh, you. i move to next presentation now uh, let us listen from uh, uh, shri mosarraf hosen space physics laboratory VSSC Trivandrum on thermospheric neutral winds and temperature. First result from an Indian equatorial station. Hello. Hello, Musarab ji. Hello. Good evening. Yeah. Yeah, yeah can you hear me? Go ahead now. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. So this is uh, Mosarraf Hussain. Your slide is not changing up. It will. Uh, yeah, it will come now. Okay. Yeah. Fine. So <clears throat> myself, Mosarraf Hussain. I am from Space Physics Laboratory. So I'll be presenting the first results on the measurement of thermospheric neutral wind and temperature from an equatorial Indian station. from trivandrum so these measurements we have carried out optically using uh, one doppler fabry perot interferometer which we call dfpi uh, you can see uh, on the right this photograph of this dfpi system at trivandrum and uh, it is it is better it can be understood uh, in terms of its semantic 
So on the left side, I have put the schematic of this mechanical structure and the major components of the DFPI. So at the heart of this instrument is basically a uh, dispersing element, which is a four inch high resolution Fabry Perot etalon that is seen here. And in addition to this, another crucial optical component is an, a narrow band interference filter at the central wavelength of 630 nanometer with the bandwidth of narrow band, uh, bandwidth of four angstrom bandwidth of this interference filter. And at the detector, we use one uh, very highly sensitive back illuminated CCD, which is, which is a grade one CCD for scientific imaging purpose. So you can see on the right here uh, uh, that one, one, it, it contains a ledger, frequency stabilized ledger and one white light system. And this is shown, uh, we see the CCD camera here. And on the inset, we have kept that uh, one pointing head mirror, which is crucial for acquiring the data. So on the top uh, top uh, right, we can see the fringe systems, two fringe systems on the one on the top, other at the bottom. The top fringe systems is basically obtained by uh, using this DFPI, using helium neon ledger. So this, is, this contains the information on the instrument function of this system. And the bottom, this, this is the print systems we got using the 630 nanometer air glow emissions. As you know that this comes from around 220 to 280 kilometers of the upper atmosphere and emitted by atomic oxygen. So this print systems contains the information on the thermally broadened line shape of that 630 nanometer air glow, as well as the its Doppler shift. By processing this information, so we can derive the wind and temperature information. So in just this GFPI provides uh, that nighttime 630 nanometer air glow emission intensity, relative intensity, and line of sight neutral temperature and wind in north, south, east, west directions. And it provides the neutral meridional and zonal wind speeds. So typically in a night, around 65 to 66 values of this meridional and zonal wind we get using a three minute exposure time. So in this work, in addition to this winds and temperature obtained by DFPI, we have also used that MCS model data for temperature data and that SWM horizontal wind model data for wind data. And this data are obtained using solar activity period, low solar activity period of June 17 to April 18. So coming to the just a glance of this, what kind of data it was used to get from this DFPI. So this figure on the left, it gives three days of data in January. And uh, on the top panel, you can see this is the meridional, inter meridional wind. And on, on the positive y-axis, it, it is the uh, northwards meridional wind, and on the negative y-axis, it is the southward. And in the middle panel, we can see that horizontal horizontal uh, wind. So on the positive values are eastward, and the negative values are westward. And the low, and the lower lowest uh, bottom panel, we can see the the temperature distribution uh, obtained in these three days. On the right, in the, in the similar manner, we see, we these are the Meridional wind, zonal wind, and temperature. So we can see here that 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 in the temperature distribution. So one thing is that we can see from these figures that there is there is a significant uh, day to night to night variations in the wind as well as temperature. So we can see here that some kind of double humped kind of structure we can we we we, get, we are used to get in the temperature, specifically in the autumnal equinox and wind uh, winter solstice seasons. So the First hump is arises around in 22 hours, and the second hump is around 28 hours. And in between, see we can see uh, some uh, prominent uh, the temperature minimum. So the, this kind of prominent another temperature minimum we can get it in this uh, 20, January 20, 22nd uh, data. Uh, and you see in the here in the bottom we have we have put here some temperature distribution data, and these different colors denotes east, north, south, and west. And we can see that this that uh, line of sight temperature distribution, which we're getting from different directions are almost same. And here we have put, in, a, in addition to this temperature obtained on these two days, we have put also the model data. So we can see that uh, this, our uh, temperature data, almost it is very nicely matching with the model data. Now coming to the seasonal distribution, seasonal variabilities of the DFPI and model meridional waves. Uh, so this figure shows that seasonal variations of this uh, meridional winds, both from obtained from DFPI, Doppler FPI, as well as wind. So we can see that that throughout the season, 
the temperature, uh, the wind changes from around, varies from around minus 70 to 65 meter per second. So in the April, we can see that the southward winds goes up to around minus 70, 70 meter per second. And in December, it goes up to around 65 uh, meter per second. So within this range, throughout the seasons, temper, uh, these winds are there. Okay, now we can see that on the summer solstice, this is the summer solstice, winds are uh, typically in the southern direction. So both model and our uh, measured wind shows this thing. And the, in the winter solstice, that typically, uh, mostly that uh, wind, meridional wind in the southern hemisphere. So we can see that the meridional winds exhibit the expected signature of trans-equatorial flow from summer to winter hemisphere. So now we can see from this uh, figure that our this meridional winds actually exhibits three distinct stages. The first stage between 19 to 21 hours. This is the time period uh, just after sunset. And so from 19 to 21 hours within plus minus one hour. So here we can see that uh, from uh, from uh, except August, except August in all other months, uh, between 19 to 21 hours, within plus minus one hour, we can see the uh, wind. So here, the wind, uh, you can see from each of this plot. So it is in initially it is increasing, and gradually it is decreasing, and at around 22 hours, it is just, uh, it is changing to southward. And the, the second one, in the second time period, from 21 hours to 1 a.m., we can see that within plus minus one hour, that wind are southward. And one, one noticeable thing here that at around 23 hours, that reversal of this meridional winds occurs systematically, consistently in all the months, except this, this vernal equinox where this, uh, this reversal happens around within one, 12, 12 to one, one o'clock. And lastly, in this after one o'clock to 4.30 plus minus one hour, this is the, this is the stage where uh, again, the winds become northward and gradually it is increasing. It is reaching a peak at around 3, 3.15 and coming back. So these are the typical thing are also displayed by the model wind. So, so we can see that, that meridional winds, uh, okay. So now similar to the model, this GFPI wind uh, variabilities throughout the season. So systematic oscillations around along the y-axis. We can, if you see from July, from July onwards, December, along uh, that our DFPI meridional winds along with the model winds just starts rising up along the y-axis and gradually it is rising up and it is reaching up to around December. After December from January onwards, again systematically, both the wind pattern are gradually going down till the June. Here the May, May, May data is missing. So we can see that the DFPI meridional winds are predicted by this horizontal wind model remarkably, very, very, very nicely, very ex excellently. So, so we can validate our uh, DFPI data using this model. So for further, further validation, we have taken uh, the data which was uh, uh, taken, uh, obtained from INOS wind measurement. So our colleagues from here at SPL, they published a paper uh, in JSTP in 2016 so they showed, uh, they used the data of between 1989 to 2008. So they, this plot belongs to this paper. So we can see that, that meridional winds, the seasonal as well as uh, the temporal variation of this wind here. So we can, if we compare, so whatever attributes so far I have described, it's also matching here perfectly, except around one to one, 1.5 hours of shift. So we can see instead of that, uh, reversal at around 23 hours. Here, the reversals are happening 22 hours. So overall, we get a very good matching with this INSONA-derived medical uh, meridional winds with our DFPI-derived uh, tripped winds. So coming to the zonal winds, so this shows that uh, seasonal variability of the zonal winds derived, uh, obtained from our DFPI as well as model. So we can see that this DFPI winds are remaining within minus 14 to 80 meter per second. Okay. Yeah. So here, some interesting observation we have made that uh, the pre-reversal enhancement exists in solar summer solstice time. You see that in summer solstice, that wind initially, zonal wind starts increasing and it is peaking around 
the maximum at around 13 hours. So in throughout the summer solstice, we can see that the post evening maxima in the general wind, which is also matching with that of the model, except for some uh, the time shift, time shift. So you know that this the, re the possible region, region for this pre-reversal, uh, this kind of uh, enhancement in the general wind is the one of the region is PRE. So we can say here that uh, that PRE, the, the possible region for enhancement in this that first evening journal wind is the PRE. So we have found this result, which is unlike a observation from Trivandrum earlier, that there is no P existence of no PRE exists in summer solstice. We can see from this plot uh, obtained by the author Haridas et al. that this shows that this, uh, the temporal variation of vertical drift, okay, along with time. So we can see that the red curve shows that the drift at summer solstice. So as per this paper from Trivandrum, whatever they observed using this data, that in summer solstice, there is no existence of any PRE, but we got a PRE. And also in the, on the other hand, we got a maximum PRE in the winter solstice season. We can see that in the winter solstice season, that journal wind post evening maximas are maximum compared to other seasons. And he, this is linked with that basically PRE. So, we can tell that the largest PRE occurs in winter solstice, which is agreeing with, which is in, in basically agreement with that, that this their study. We can see that blue curb, which is the vertical drip, because vertical drip variation with time. So in the winter solstice, they also got the maximum PRE. So our observations are in uh, agreement with their study. So now one interesting thing is that over Trivandrum, the journal winds over Trivandrum are found weaker. So you can see maximum wind speed we got around 80 meter per second in comparison to some other sectors like African sector and Brazilian sector. We got, yeah. So, uh, so this post, okay. So now, so we found that the region for this journal wind minimum, uh, the weaker journal wind in Trivandrum is the basically the PRE. So we got this, uh, we used the data um, published by Lee et al. And we saw that, that our, uh, the Trivandrum, the journal wind and Trivandrum is around 37% and 81% less than in African sector. And when we, we started finding the possible region for this, we found that following this Lee et al, that Trivandrum PRE vertical drips around 17% and 79% less than in African and Brazilian sector. So we can see that the PRE drips, which is less than around 17%, but, but we got that wind speed around 37% less. So to some extent, these two are matching. But in Brazilian please sector, conclude. yeah, please yeah. conclude. Yeah. In the Brazilian sector, there is excellent matching between that PRE data. So we we we, we conclude that that the reduced general wind, wind speed in Trivandrum is because of reduced PRE over Trivandrum, and this is the temperature data. Here, uh, the notable I think things we are, are running out of time, sir. I think you you may okay. So the, kind of here also there is overall very good agreement between the DFPI temperature with the and with the MCS model. Uh, so. Um, so we found around 427 degree Kelvin kind of temperature in April, which is around 240 Kelvin less than the corresponding model value. So this is one of the interesting observations. And we see that, that there's the overall agreement between the DFPI meridional winds and the temperature also. We can see in the winter solstice decision. So this January, uh, the temperature variation and this here, the meridional wind variation are also matching very nicely. So, uh, so this is our another observation. So these are the conclusions which we have already discussed. So I would yeah, like yeah. to say that the measurements carried out by our DFPI, temperature and winds are, these are the representative of this equatorial Indian region. And this is very interesting and new data. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Musarraf and uh, the contributors of this talk. I think these are one of the rare results of the meridional and journal wind observation. And I really appreciate a lot of effort which has gone into and uh, I'm seeing it. Yeah. Uh, Professor Pallam Raju from PRL uh, is willing to ask. Sir, please. Yes. Yes. Uh, hello, am I audible? Yes, sir, please. Yeah. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, results are uh, nice, Musharraf. Uh, very good. Uh, I would like to know what is the, uh, maybe the, what was the uh, FP you have used? What is the spacing? Yeah, 15, 15 millimeter, 15 mm. 15 mm. And, uh, uh, where did you uh, buy this FP from? Which uh, company? Uh, this is basically we got it developed with collaboration with CPI from US. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Fine. Nice. Yes. Thanks. That's it. Thank you. 
anyone else uh, i have one small clarification uh, sir uh, yes have you looked into what is the cause between uh, difference between the modal observer uh, that is like sira or msis model and uh, your observations there are kind of like climatological like background matches there but still uh, there are several uh, differences very major differences uh, even in the mean so what will be the reason uh, definitely model is going to be improved but what is that lacuna in the model that one need to now look forward from here yeah so uh, as far as uh, our measurements are concerned we have seen it is overall agreement uh, specifically for meridional winds it is excellently matching but in general winds there is a uh, differences uh, sometimes it is out of page in, in some of the month <laughs> so i think uh, i think some more data on uh, satellite based data as well as ground based data should 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 fit should be fed into the models okay. to get the uh, improvement in the model specifically for our region fine sir one yeah. more question is uh, there from shrivati yeah please shrivati please go ahead yeah i just wanted to know uh, small cl clarification uh, you mentioned uh, the cfpa uh, observations in the night sector right So, is it uh, only during uh, possible occurrence times, or uh, any other uh, night, day-to-day -day variabilities? For example, if we want to study the winds, do yeah. you get every day? Yes. In no, respect no. of the whether it is possible or not. Yeah, this variability we have seen sometimes. Let's say in a month, we have seen sometimes. This is almost that that Donald that variation night uh, temporal variations are matching, but but month to month there is some differences, significant differences are there. No, no. Uh, my my question no, no, is no. Uh, whether yeah, we uh, can operate. Uh, yeah, around typically twenty to twenty-one days we can operate. No, no. My question is, uh, your FPA uh, operates uh, irrespective of plasma bubble is present or not? Yes, yes. Yeah, so they operate. They operate. Shivati, this is uh, based on day glow, so it's uh, like a layer uh, which is uh, having a uh, night glow uh, where the peak is there. They will operate uh -huh. and see the difference and then. Okay. Next. Like all the images, uh -huh. all the images uh, they see only plasma bubbles, right? Whenever plasma bubble is there, then only they operate. Yeah, But yeah. Uh, this is February, sir. This is, this is I this think, February. Most of uh, the results are from February. Okay, okay. Yeah, this is a narrow field of view instrument. This is not yeah. all the yeah. images. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. If there are. And and also I have a small uh, clarification. You mentioned uh, PRE and this journal uh, winds. Yeah. You see, sometimes uh, journal wind uh, uh, you measure at one altitude, but uh, PRE height may be other altitude. How do you say that uh, PRE is absent, but your winds are uh, showing PRE kind of thing? Yeah. So Mostly our measurements. Yeah, I think it is the effect of the electric field. Okay, so yeah. they, what they are measuring is uh, not the effect of PRE, but that uh, yeah. the electric field. So the journal effect of that, I think, is uh, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. And also there are there are shears, right? Maybe winds are different altitude, different winds. So you are measuring yeah. only one altitude. Yes. So this is not exactly one alt altitude, but air glow emissions which are coming from our integrated things we are measuring basically. Hmm. Complete layer uh, there, so is it layer, basically they yeah. are measuring intensity and the difference in the fabric of fringes. Uh, correct. One, uh, one small uh, question yeah. is there uh, from Ramesh. I will take on last question. Any yeah. contribution from gravity waves or tides on seasonal variation in zonal and meridional winds? Please tell. Can you please one second repeat the question? Uh, it is on chat chat box. Any contribution from gravity waves or tides on seasonal variation in zonal and meridional winds? I mean, he's asking: Is there any contribution that you have seen in the seasonal variation of the winds? Yeah. So there will be definitely some tides. contributions. So we have to look into all those things. Ah, This is just the preliminary result. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Fine. Yeah, okay. Thanks. Uh, I think then we are uh, uh, coming to the end of the session now, uh, and there is a break. But uh, we are supposed to take a break. Uh, I request uh, my session chair, Prof. Dr. Tarun sir. Yes, uh, Nirvikar. I think uh, we can uh, probably fifteen uh, minutes break. We can take. Okay. Uh, so okay. we'll be back by four uh, forty-five. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And then yeah, uh, yeah we will be back at four forty-five, and we'll start with the presentation from Suman Kumar Das. Yes. Yeah. Then thank you. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So we'll reassemble at four uh, forty-five. Yes, sir. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>